So, you're in for a real treat this evening. I am blessed to be able to welcome Andrew Keane to Virtual Futures. And for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim, hidden behind the brush still, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno parties, was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, is cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Tonight, we're joined by Andrew Keane, tech commentator and internet critic. The future is broken and needs to be fixed. At least, this is the claim made by Andrew in his new book, How to Fix the Future, Staying Human in the Digital Age. It's a departure from his usual brand of sarcasm or controversy. This book attempts to be cautiously optimistic about the next phase of the so-called digital revolution. And by assuming that the future will be a continuation of the present, Keane provides an outline to ensure the survival of human agency. For this, the book doesn't promise a radical retooling of society, but advocates a more active engagement with the systems and structures that we have now. So to share how we will stay human in the digital age, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Andrew Keane to the Virtual Futures stage. So, Andrew, why do we need to fix the future? And uh, how do you know the future is broken? Well, the future is always broken. I mean, there's always things to fix. Um, I mean, it's a nice title, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not my title, by the way. Oh, okay. My, uh, my publishers. So I, I didn't have much choice over the title. But, you know, the future is always broken. There's always things to fix. Uh, it may be particularly broken now, but we always think it's particularly broken. We always think we're living in special times. We always think the problems we face are bigger than any other previous generation, and of course they never are. Um, so uh, this could have been written in 1850, it could have been written in 1750 or 1650, and in fact the book is essentially a a kind of remix of Moore's Utopia, which was written in the 16th century, which was also a book about fixing the future. Now, of course, my book isn't quite as good as that one, but um, similar themes. Future's broken, so how to fix it. So let's talk about Moore's Law. That, that's what begins the Moore's book. Moore's Law? Well, there's Moore's Law, Moore, there's Moore's Law, Moore's Law there's Moore's, 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 Moore's Laws than we realize. Yeah. And there's, there's the Moore's Law that we, we sort of know about technological, uh, uh, this exponential curve of technological innovation, and there's also Thomas... More and is there a reason why you start with Thomas More's Utopia? Why? Well, because there's comparison? nothing more boring than starting a book with Gordon Moore, right? <laughs> I mean, the tech books are incredibly boring, even mine. And um, so, well, you know, we're trying to sell this book, don't you? Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> there are, I forgot there about are copies that. of the back, but right. apparently it is don't, boring, yeah. and he didn't pick the title. So, um, but uh, well, it's supposed to be an irreverent event, right? Aren't we supposed to? Isn't that what you were encouraging? Irreverence? Uh, okay, we can do, <laughs> we can general. do irreverency, but your poor publisher at the back uh, is sitting there going, we want to shift these 20 books that we brought yeah. along. Well, you should feel sorry for her. And she's, <laughs> uh, so, All right, so Thomas More. Thomas More and yeah, well, you know, most no. tech, you, everyone here has read the, a lot of tech books. And after a while, they are boring, I think. And they always start with Moore's Law. They always start with, well, there's this thing called Moore's Law, which explains why everything's changing so fast. Uh, and um, you know, it's it's a it's a fair point. I mean, to explain why we've gone from su supercomputers existing in you know buildings the size of this to ones that we can carry around in our pockets in fifty years, you have to explain Moore's law, uh, uh, Gordon Moore's law. That is. So I figured, well, let's try and start with something a bit more interesting than Gordon Moore. So I thought of Thomas Moore's law, and uh, it's a different kind of law. It's a human law. It's about agency. You know, Moore's Law, Gordon Moore's Law is a, a scientific truth, or a certainly, it may not exist forever, but for the last 50 years, 
it was he came up with the idea what well, he didn't come up with the, the law someone else called it Moore's law but he came up with the observation in a 1965 electronics magazine article and uh it's been pretty much true that chip power has doubled every i think he originally said two years i think it's every 18 months now uh it can't last forever but for the moment it's been that the change has been so exponential that it's changed everything my argument at the beginning of the book is that Moore's law, the, the Gordon, uh, Gordon Moore's law has run ahead of us as humans. It's created such a dramatic, um, disruptive change uh, in, in everything. You know, this is a, a tech audience. So, you know, whether it's the radical sort of reinvention of media, the imminent joblessness crisis, uh, inequality that's created by technological innovation, the cultural crisis of fake news and narcissism, the digital surveillance uh, capitalism of Facebook and Google, all that comes out of Moore's law. So it's, all, we've, it's run ahead of us as humans. We, we are feeling rather disempowered. We're feeling as if we're not quite sure how to keep up with this thing. We're also feeling, I, I mean, I, I hope I'm not speaking on behalf of everyone, but I think a lot of people feel they're not quite sure how to deal with this. It, it seems beyond our control. So when you talk to people about, well, you know, are your kids addicted to cell phones? Or what's going to happen when machines replace all jobs? Or uh, does, doesn't it bother you that you're being watched in everything you do? Or um, why, why is everyone uh, in, unable to talk to one another anymore? Because we're all on, you know, Facebook or some other echo chamber. We all feel as if, well, we can't really change it. These forces are so huge. And of course they are. They're historical forces. Then we would have we might have said the same thing in the middle of the nineteenth century. When the, the the physical change was even more dramatic, but a similar sort of impact on jobs, identity, uh, wealth, economics, class. Um so my Moore's Law, uh, Thomas Moore's Law, focuses on agency. My reading of Utopia, for what it's worth, is that Moore himself actually was anything but a utopian. And he was writing against Luther's notion of predestination. I think um, Moore is often, uh, Thomas Moore is often positioned as conservative in contrast with a populist like uh, Luther. So people like John Norton, a very well-known tech writer who, who, who actually very uh, kindly gave my book a nice review. But I think he positions kind of Luther as an example of an early disruptor, when in fact I think Luther is the quintessential example of an anti-humanist because his theory of predestination essentially denied us any agency. And I think more... You know, he certainly wasn't an ideal man. We know he his, his, I don't know how many of you know about him. This isn't a book about Moore or a conversation about Moore. But certainly his, his life is controversial. He became a martyr. But he was also, I think, guilty of some various forms of persecution, cruel persecutions against Protestants. But what Moore was reminding us of is our agency. What Moore said in Utopia is that our responsibility as humans is to shape our society as much as we can. And I think that's what Utopia is about. So at the beginning of my book, I come up with this alternative to Gordon Moore's law, which is Thomas Moore's law, which is about agency. And I think agency is a particularly, it's always an important issue because we always feel kind of daunted by these vast historical forces that we don't really understand and can't control. Uh, but it's particularly true today because we've invented uh, technology, smart machines that replicate much of who we are and what we do. So the issue of agency, I'm, I'm not trying to make the argument that we live in unique times or special times because in 50 years there'll be other technologies or other developments that will seem now much larger probably than what we're going through now. But it does seem as if the issue of agency is particularly paramount, which is why I begin the book with Moore's Law and, and, and stressing agency. Because the one thing smart machines can't do, I think, is think for themselves. They don't have consciousness. They can't have agency. They don't have empathy. They can't be creative. And I quote around this um, Ada Lovelace, the British uh, self-taught mathematician, pub probably the most important person in the whole history of computing. She was the business partner of Babbage, who invented the mechanical 
computer, but she was much smarter, I think, than him. And she came up with the idea of software. And when she came up with the idea of software, she stressed that computers can't think for themselves. And just as they couldn't in the middle of the 19th century, so I don't think they can now. So we still have a role. I think the subtitle of my book, which I actually prefer in some ways to the title, uh, it's a bit boring, but it, it's more accurate. How to stay human in the digital age. Of course, being human is a tricky one. I mean, we all have different definitions of what that means. But what's, I, what's... I really wanted to, the, the point of the book is to somehow rediscover a tradition of humanism and fit it into my narrative. Because otherwise, it's just everyone has their own definition of what it means to be human, and it becomes entirely meaningless. So in that case, what is the Andrew Keane definition of what it means to be human? So you, you talk about this crisis of agency in the book. You talk about human agency and what's happening to human agency in the 21st century. Yeah, I mean, my, my definition of what it means to be human is to... I, I think it's probably taken from more... And then it's a, a, tr a political tradition that has been used by all sorts of people from Machiavelli to Arendt, the notion of being political. And I, I don't really, you know, it's not really a piece of political theory, but uh, certainly it's that idea that our, our job is to, is, is to shape, you know, what being human, and it comes from, obviously from Aristotle, that being human means being political and making our societies better. And I think Moore's Utopia is a sort of central piece of that. I was a um, uh, uh, graduate school in, in Berkeley in the 90s. I was uh, in the 80s. I was taught by a woman called uh, Hannah Pitkin, who had been a student of Arendt. And um, she sort of taught me this whole uh, civic tradition. So for me, it was, a, it was a nice opportunity to fit in some of my graduate school work, given that I was thrown out of graduate school for bad behavior. Um, at least and that's the story some, we'd got, like to hear. No, I got, that's what's missing in the book. Yeah, well, it's, uh, I don't think people buy the book for that. But um, at least I got my money's worth out of grad school. Not that I paid for it, but somebody else did. Uh, so I didn't get a degree, but at least I got half a book out of it, or at least some ideas in a book. All right, so look, we've heard about your crisis of your, your graduate degree, but what about the crisis of agency? Can you talk specifically to the problem that you set up in the book, this, this whole thing around crisis of agency? Where are we in the 21st century? Where do you believe we are in the 21st century? And again, why do you think the future is, is broken? Well, I told you, the future is always broken. It's always broken because there's always things wrong. Uh, now, we may, not always we may not always come up with the notion, we may not always come up with the language that the future is broken to describe what's wrong, but the reason why this title, I think, resonates is because we have been fixated with the ideal, maybe even the ideology of the future. But, 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 so, no, I... so, you know, there's always things to fix. It's just at the moment, there seems to be many, many different things to fix. Most, I mean, most people here, I think, would agree on either the left. I mean, it's one of, it's again, a cause and a consequence of our malaise, whether you're on the left or you're right, or, or the right. Uh, everyone thinks things are really bad. I mean, it's not just, you know, Brexit or Trump. There's something deeper than that. But then my problem is, why do we believe that this future is something we can fix? Isn't it human hubris to actually believe that we have any agency in designing the well, Now you're sounding like Martin Luther. What do you mean we don't have any agency? So we might as well just give up and go home. Of course we have agency. Of course we can shape our futures. Um, otherwise, what's the point of doing anything? But then the future, the sorts of futures and the predictions that you were making back in sort of the 90s, the, the, the future that you thought we were going to get, or at least your peers thought we were going to get, never happens. Right. So could it get a lot worse before it gets a lot better? Um, yeah, of course it can. I mean, it, it, terrible things can happen. I mean, think of, I mean, we already have um, a, a narcissist president who is the sort of worst, or seems to be at least at this point, the worst case manifestation of social media. Um, but I, I don't see why it couldn't get worse. Um, we, we already have the five most valuable companies in the world all being West Coast tech companies, uh, all of them in, in, in many ways more powerful than any government, certainly with more economic resources than most government, less accountable. We already have a, a, a looming massive structural job crisis on, on the horizon, uh, a crisis about what exactly we as humans are going to do in an age of smart machines when they can pretty much replicate most of what we do. Uh, we already have 
surveillance capitalism where these large companies know pretty much if they want to, they can know everything about all of us. So it can get a lot worse. We're seeing w what the real nightmare is in China. China is the worst case future at the moment. Um, much worse than Russia. I mean, Russia is a joke, you know, full of clowns. But Russia, uh, China isn't. China, there aren't clowns in China. Very smart people, brilliant business people, uh, remarkable technologists, and they're building a, a digital version of Orwell's 1984, a place where everything is watched, a place where you get rewarded for your political correctness. The president there is already sort of reinventing himself as mouth, using technology. They're deploying facial recognition technology and all these new technologies to enforce their own dictatorship. So it can get a lot worse. And I'm not saying China will come to America or the UK. I don't think that's the case. But I've heard rumors that, you know, it's going to get a lot worse in terms of digital warfare. It's going to get a lot worse in terms of what hacks... Um, probably Russian or Chinese supported ha hackers get up to in terms of undermining our democracy. So it can get, yeah, much, much worse than it is now. At the moment, it's not that bad. It's just kind of absurd. Well, you, <laughs> right? I mean, you, we have a, a, you know, in, I mean, you can't, I mean, you can blame a lot of things on the internet. I don't think you can really blame Brexit on the internet. And, you know, even Trump, who knows, a bit of this and a bit of that. Well, maybe you can blame bad. all these things on human agency. That's the real, that's the real. Well, I mean, no, but, but I think that human agency is interesting in Brexit and Trump terms because it is, they are examples of how people are frustrated and how they want to manifest their agency. And at least in my view, I'm guessing most of you probably would agree, they're making fundamental errors that the, you know, if you're a, if you're a coal miner and you voted for Trump, it was in a way to protect your own agency and in the long run that's probably not true if you if you're a fisherman in Hull it's the same reason to vote for Brexit but ultimately in the long run probably doesn't benefit you but you know these are complicated issues so are these digital tools to a degree giving us an insight into really the the dark sides of what it means to be human Adam Greenfield said here dark about, sides that sounds well, look, dark sides this, this, of what it means to be human Adam Greenfield said look the, these tools are what we wanted it wasn't necessarily what we thought it was going to be but that's always the case I mean every time anyone comes up with anything new it gets abused I mean in political terms again the you know the analogies are obvious that various modern revolutions they've all been articulated in the language and then that was Moore's point in utopia to warn us about utopian promises that they're usually empty and dangerous and it was been true throughout history and it's certainly true with the internet i don't think people were necessarily lying but they were either incredibly simplistic or they had no understanding of the world like tim berners lee or they were masquerading behind the interests of their own companies like mark zuckerberg but you know, the promises these people made were entirely bogus. Well, let's, let's talk about the word then that sort of sells the book. It's the word future. Everybody seems to I be... I don't know that. Well, it's certainly not fixed. Does okay, sell the book? <laughs> I'll you. Have a future. But um, Kirsty, does that sell the book? The, future, well, the word future. The future, the future is in vogue. The, fu the future to a degree is in vogue. And it feels like the reason we are attaching ourselves to futures or the future is because it's an escapism from the present. I don't we agree. I think the future is in crisis. I don't think it's in vogue. I think it's the opposite. I think 30 years ago, the future was in vogue. People believed in the future. I mean, I stole... I think the future is in vogue again, don't you? With the, um, it's with because, what? because of these hyper-capitalist things that are happening with Elon Musk sending things into space. That, that There's a co-option of the future and it's used as leverage against us. It's still a political tool. It's still a profitability tool. Yeah. People use futures or set up futures as leverage against human individuals. We're not doing it because it's easy. We're doing it because it's hard. The future is leveraged as a political tool. Right now, Elon Musk makes some grand claim about something that may happen in the future, and we see real-term uh, impacts in the present. His stock market price of Tesla may increase based on a tweet that promises a certain future. And then for a lot of these folks, so the transhumanist folks that you mentioned in passing in your book, a lot of their futures are, are leveraged around their personal qualms. They want to live forever because they, they know their bodies are failing or they want to bring back their dead fathers in the case of Ray Kurzweil. Do you think the future is a contested term insofar as is always used as a control mechanism? You don't have to think about the present if you're thinking about the future and the future could potentially be better. In America, as you know, where you live, the future's awesome. Not so much in the UK. No, I don't agree with you. I, uh, you know, I, I don't know what you're saying, actually. 
Well, um, what's your point? My my point is my point is is the future used as a tool of leverage. So we do we use tool of leverage? What does that mean? Leverage against us. So leverage against us. Who by? I mean, against you and I. By the individuals who want to make us feel more comfortable with our shitty presence. So the big joke about the virtual futures audience is a lot of us are here not because we're excited about the future, but because it's escapism from the present. Yeah. I don't buy that. I don't buy that the future is escapism from the present. I mean, look, there's lots of escapism. There's virtual reality. There's drugs. There's, I don't know, there's going to sleep. But, uh, you know, watching football, especially last night. Um, but I don't, I don't buy that. I mean, my argument is actually the reverse. What I'm saying is, is that uh, if you care about the future, caring about the future is what being human is, and you try to shape a society to the best of your knowledge. Now, look, I'm not a massive defender of Musk, but what he's trying to do is interesting and credible. I, I think in, in some ways he's hyperbolic. In some ways he's probably uh, a bit of an operator. But I think some of the things he's doing is important. I think Tesla is an extremely interesting and important company. I'm not a big fan of private space travel, but it's interesting and credible. It's certainly not an attempt to control people or an attempt to take people so it's an attempt to control a stock market price to a degree what they do is they promise a future argue that that future will occur and because they have certain means financial means to potentially build that one future which may or may not arrive their stock market price in the nah, present is that's impacted. a kind of conspiracy i think it's it's wrong i mean look amazon Bezos did a very good job, or has always done a very good job, in your language, controlling the future. He's always sold the idea of the future to Wall Street and said to his investors, or said to the to Wall Street, "Look, we're, we're not going to do a lot of, we're not going to make a lot of profit in in the short term because we're building a long term company." But he's done it so brilliantly and successfully that he's got away with it. Now, I don't think that's. I think it's, I mean, I'm not, again, I've been very critical of Amazon in the past, but I don't think that side of Amazon is bad. It, it's very, very hard. I mean, you know, Tim, I don't know if you've had Tim O'Reilly on your show, but Tim O'Reilly's argument is that the problem with contemporary capitalism is it's too short-termism. The problem with contemporary capitalism is there is no conception of the future. So you have, you know, kind of, uh, and there's a big movement in San Francisco sort of a, a, around the ideal of the long future. Um, so I, I, I would not, I don't share your critique of the future. I think it's, it's, it's what it means to, as I said at the beginning, it's what it means to be human. Now you don't always have to use the word future, but it, it, the future deals with the possible, not the actual. And there's multiple I'd argue there isn't just the one future, but let's... Yeah, there are many futures. I mean, I wouldn't disagree with that, but I think the notion that people control the future and are manipulating it, I think is, is, is too simple. It's a sort of, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of an internet meme and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's a sexy one in today's age of, of, of sort of paranoia about conspiracies, but I don't think it's true. I don't think it's paranoia about conspiracies. I'm saying in America... Well, you're saying it is. It's a, some, there's no, 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 some no, no, conspiracy no, no. for saying, people I'm saying to... It, it, we're not doing it because it's easy. We're doing it because it's hard. The space race was about owning the future yeah. because if you own the future, you own the present in the hearts and minds of the American people. But that's what, I, I think, that's what capitalism is, owning the future. And that's what Bezos has been so successful. And that's why Amazon is now the most important company, in, not only in tech, but in the world. It's the company that everyone fears. It's the company that is dominating every market. I mean, even in advertising, we, we've all heard about the duopoly of Facebook and Google in advertising. I mean, supposedly control 85% of the market. I did an interview with Martin Sorrell, the WPP chairman uh, at CES this year. And he says that this is the year where Amazon joined those guys and, be and it becomes a, th a three-party a three -party race to control advertising. So, yeah, I mean, Bezos is very smart, but the, sp the stock market rewards successful futurists because that's how you build companies at scale. I mean, look... Uh, uh, Bezos has, has, has been remarkably successful. I mean, that's it's. I'm not sure if that's a critique of Bezos or of the system. It's in the nature of things. 
and worry that we're going to Martin Sorrell as the person to fix our future. Isn't no, I didn't he, say isn't that. He, isn't WPP and those ad agencies part of the reason these behavioral modification empires exist in the first place? The fact that advertising dollar well, drives I, the actual I, design I of digital platforms. No, I wasn't justifying Martin no, or the behavioral, whatever you call them. What do you call them? Well, it's Jaron's term. It's Jaron Lanyard's term. Behavioral modification empires. The, the latest book is exactly that. He has a he, His argument is we should all switch them off, quite frankly. We should get off them. Whether we will or not is another right. thing. Right, but but, but uh, what I'm saying is is that Martin simply made a, an observation about business practices about a market which has been dominated by two companies, which will have there'll be a third company which will also dominate this market, and it's a company that already controls e-commerce, already is pretty much dominant in internet web in web services, is sort of introducing a new digital kind of tailorism into the marketplace, and has been more successful than any other company in convincing Wall Street that it's very good at taking the long view and that they don't have to worry about short-term profit. So Amazon, for better or worse, is, I guess, you know, we may not be completely disagreeing on all this, but Amazon is an example of a company that has successfully leveraged the future uh, to make huge fortunes. But in defense of Amazon, they're not some um, empty web startup. I mean, this is a real company. You can only do this you, you can't mislead people forever. I mean, they have delivered and they continue to deliver, which is why people have faith in them. Are you, are you arguing to a degree, and there's little bits of it in the book, that we should be trusting the digital platforms to fix the future? Because No, I never said that in the book. Well, you spend a lot of time with those CEOs and founders and you interview these individuals about yeah. how they want to fix the future. And of course, they have one care in mind, which is the survival of their non-human agent, their corporation. They care less about the long-term survival of humanity. Let's, let's spend a little bit of time on the digital platforms because that's really what the book is problematizing. That's the future that's yeah. been built and you believe that the digital revolution should be tamed, it should be managed, and it should be reformed. Yeah. And if so, what ways can it be? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I... I, I, you know, there are, there is a school of thought that believes that the way to fix the future is to essentially get rid of the market, and that there is an alternative to market capitalism. Uh, and you hear that more and more, and I don't believe that. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not some free market person. I, I mean, I, my my argument is that we've always had five tools to fix the future: regulation, innovation, consumer activism citizenship, sort of Moore's law and education. And the same is true then as now. If we're to fix the problem of digital platforms, we need more regulation, but more innovation too. So examples of that would be something like the general data protection regulation, which creates more of a level playing field, which enables more entrepreneurs to actually take on the platforms. Another example would be antitrust. I, I have a section of the book in which I talk to Margaret Vestager. And... Um, uh, I think she's doing a, an extraordinary job taking on these large companies and forcing them to obey by the law. She forced also Apple to obey by the law in terms of the paying of taxes. Uh, I think that Europe is leading in that way. So I'm certainly not sympathetic to these platforms. But at the same time, I, I don't think you can... I mean, I did an event earlier this week where this guy was getting more and more frustrated by saying, well, why can't we just ban them or nationalize them or their utilities? Well, I think, you know, I grew up in the England of the 70s and 80s, and we are quite well aware of what happens when you nationalize things and start calling everything a utility. It's not, doesn't have a very happy ending. So I think we have to be realistic here that these things can be reformed, they can be changed, you can have laws, uh, you can have regulation but they are still essential for innovation and the creation of wealth. But at what point is it too late? Too late? For too what? late to step in. It feels it's like never it's, too late. instead of fixing the future, it's just fixing incrementally the present. It doesn't feel like there's anything radical about relying on, on government or education or regulation. Well, give me an example. Okay, so give me... I, I give me an example of a model that you're talking about that you admire as uh, historically where somebody has fixed the present, uh, fixed the future. So platform cooperativism, for what example, is a what response is to you don't know what platform no. cooperativism is. I, I'd like you, you to quote Douglas it. Rushkoff in the book, and you don't yeah, know what I, platform I, cooperativism. I, I'd like is? to know what it, you define it as, and 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 how it manifests. What, what it's all very well in theory, but in practice, when does it ever exist? We're seeing. So we're seeing, for example, in emerging markets. 
the use of those sorts of platforms to enable community wealth. Why don't we go back yeah, to smaller? Why does it? Why does it have to be massive yeah, give me financial example. growth? Give me an example. Where does that actually work? Who's using it? You don't have an example because it doesn't exist. It's all very well, you know. Rush, I like Rushkov, but he's just a, you know, he's a New York leftist who has no idea of what's going on in the world. And you're a leftist too, but no, I'm not. I am. Say you're a leftist. (laughs) I just said I was a defender of capitalism. So you're a bad leftist. (laughs) (laughs) Misguided left. Misguided. I would say misguided. Uh, No, but look, those are the kind of phrases that are empty. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what it means. What would you use this term? But give me an example of it when it actually exists. All right, we're, we're looking for the good. We're looking for good examples that are enab- enabling. So, smaller food bank community, community food banks, for example, and community food projects, community growing projects are interesting, but they can't compete right now. But they might be the legitimate response in the future. We might have a, a reaction to these stacks, a reaction to these corporations. There might be there might. something slightly more radical than just relying on a continuation of the same. A lot of things that- might happen, but you know that's not realistic. Now, what I get into in the book are these so-called re-decentralization platforms where you have attempts to use technology to knock out the middleman, but using a still a market framework where, for example, with ride sharing, rather than Uber taking 30 or 40% of the, of the exchange, you have a direct interaction between driver and passenger or the same is true in and we, we had an example of that Patreon. in the us unfortunately it was a failed example but we're trying but we can we're try trying it. to fix the future in that way rather than relying on the present models of capitalism don't you think it's worth giving these no, other, it's other a waste models of time. A- I, I really think it's a complete waste of time you know you can you can uh, you know to put it crudely you, uh, you you know what you can do with this sort of thing we all fantasize about it we can enjoy ourselves we can spend an hour talking about these things here and we might feel very virtuous but it's irrelevant to the world they don't work and they never will work and that's the point of moore's utopia has been the point of all dystopian literature ever since and before and i don't know any examples of when it has worked and the market is for better or worse the core mechanism for creating wealth and for driving innovation. Now, you still need regulation. still important to have consumers and citizens and education. But the idea that there is some alternative to the market, which can be driven by technology, in my view, whilst in theory is, I guess, is attractive and sexy and all the rest of it, it doesn't work. We, we've, we've learned over the last 30 years it doesn't work. So why keep on falling back on something which doesn't exist you know there'll be someone here who says oh what about blockchain blockchain can do this or that all right let's let's have that discussion what about blockchain what about the re-decentralization now arguably blockchain requires well bitcoin requires the collapse of western civilization to actually value (laughs) it to justify its valuation and you know what why not that might radically fix the future well it might I mean, it would radically fix it I don't know whether we would necessarily be very happy about that look we may be on the verge, of, I, I can't remember the name of the German historian, but there's a very good German historian who just wrote a book about inequality, he looked at it historically, and he looked at societies where there were as profound a gap between rich and poor as exists today in, in Western capitalism, or for that matter, in China. And what he found was the only way those inequalities ever get fixed is either through external war or civil war. So the kind so maybe, of, maybe yeah, I mean, that we're I, on the precipice. I, well, yeah, I think we, I mean, certainly when it comes to the redistribution of wealth in the U.S., I mean, only an external event of significance will change uh, the distribution of wealth because it's not going to, I mean, we've already seen that everybody in America, even on the left, seems to think tax, tax, you know, reductions are a good thing. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's but I don't think that the technolo- technological solutions work either i mean technology can be valuable and helpful and can enable important kinds of innovation i mean in the book i talk about patreon you know this it's a sort of a network for connecting creatives and their audience and it's a better model than say youtube um because it doesn't take as much of the part and because it empowers the edge more now, I'm not sure what would happen if Patreon controlled the entire market, whether that would just revert back to a kind of YouTube arrangement. But the, the problem is in tech that for all this sort of verbiage and promise, 
the ultimate consequence always seems to be a winner-take-all market where one company, you know, YouTube at the beginning was the champion of the the small producer, champion of the edge, champion of this and that. And look at it now. I mean, it's a, it's a rentier. It's a classic rentier. It controls huge amounts of the market and essentially uh, appropriates massive amounts of tax for from creatives in order to distribute their work. So we just have to be realistic about how this thing works. Can we just hope that it collapses? Twitter, for example... Well, Twitter, no, Twitter, for collapse. example, Twitter, Twitter can't justify its IPO price. Jack Dorsey has a real problem on his hands. It would be easier to nationalize it than trying to make it make the advertising revenue that he's promised his shareholders and promised his investors. Yeah. Do you think these, these companies are, are way too big, over leveraged, and there's no way they're going to pivot them way, themselves out of this hole? Will we see one of them collapse and will the rest of them fall with? Well, we see Twitter no. go first and the rest will go into well, free fall, and then we'll be free and then we'll build something else to replace it because Twitter is to a degree a public service even though it's a private yeah. company. It's a very so useful... So in the book, I sort of touch on the idea of Twitter being nationalized. And in that sense, I think there is an argument because... Not nationalized, globalized. Why globalized? Because why would it be one nation state controlling Right, you a global that, platform. You think that the, the Chinese government would be uh, in the business of nationalizing Twitter? Well, they'll or build the their own and they'll nationalize that. And that's a... um, well, I think Twitter, there is an argument for Twitter because it has civic value because it's not a particularly important business. There isn't, it doesn't have a massive valuation. Um, but I think Twitter is an exception. I don't think that these platforms will collapse economically. I mean, unless there's some massive external event, they're very profitable. Um, they're very profitable because they've, they've figured out the holy grail of creating massive amounts of media without having to pay editors or curators. So the only way they become unprofitable or the only way they're brought down to earth is by regulators who will make them accountable for their work. But I don't believe in taxing these people. I don't believe in putting them out of business or breaking them up. But I do want them to be accountable. And that's why I think, say, what the German government's doing. So, is, uh, hold on, you don't believe in taxing them, but you think they should be accountable? Well, I don't believe, no, no, I don't believe in tax. Obviously, they should be taxed. And I believe in a, I, I personally would be in favor of a fairly, you know, a, f a fairly left-wing tax policy. But uh, I, I don't believe that we should tax them out of existence. We don't go back to, you know, the 1970s in England and, you know, tax Jack Dorsey 99%. I don't think that necessarily benefits anyone. It could benefit us as individuals. I mean, the argument is... Well, then they if, just if, leave. The like, is, look, you if know, Google you paid the their actual taxes, get, would have universal basic income already. You get already. the Rod Stewart syndrome where everyone would just leave. Um, no, not that, Jack, not that Jack, <laughs> Jack, Jack Dorsey even lives in England in the first place. And the idea of 99% tax in America is, you know, is about as likely as Donald Trump showing up in this room. So, yeah. Uh, it's, it's You'd be not, surprised. Look, we got a I weird mean, again, crowd. It's, it's yes, back to this. You know, we got to be realistic. I mean, you can tell me anything. We land on the moon. We can, you know. All right. So, uh, what, what is what is then your most realistic hope for the future? Because you've said I miss the future, and I just want to know what you actually. I didn't say I miss the future. I actually quoted Jerome Lanier, who said I miss the future, who actually denies he said that, even though it's written in his book. Uh, um, so that's. Something I can, you know, he gets really annoyed when they bring that up. So we're going to blame, we're going to blame the publisher for the title. We're going to blame the editor for what's written in your book, are we? No, I think that uh, uh, my point about I didn't say I miss the future. I said Lanier misses the future, and he captures what's gone wrong with our faith in technology to make the world a better place. Geron you know, is a really brilliant guy and a very important thinker and writer and technologist. And he, like Tim Berners-Lee, and many other of the original sort of pioneers and idealists of the digital revolution, have lost faith in it. So there's this sort of metaphor. He, 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 he has a very poetic way of putting stuff. And he said, I miss the future, meaning I miss believing in the way in which technology can make the world a better place. Well, then what visions of the future in the turn of the 21st century in 2018 can we actually believe in? Because what I was looking for in, in the book was, was, was a vision to, to work towards, and instead it was like, call your politician and hope there's regulation. Now, that's not a future that you can get excited about, that you can aim towards. Well, I think, I, you know, I spend a, um, a chapter in Estonia. I think the Estonian model's interesting, of um, 
transparency. So we should all go get digital citizenship and live in Estonia and then we'll have a very happy... Well, I think the Estonian model of creating more uh, accountability between government and, 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 and citizens and a, a more of an open system, but forcing the government to actually become accountable in terms of how they look at our data. That's one important way of thinking about this stuff. I mean, you're looking for really simple fixes. I can always, anyone no, can no, come I'm up with simple, simple fixes. I'm not looking for simple fixes because we know it's going to be complicated, but I'm worried that the only reason technology is to blame is because human agency or, or non-human no, agency of capitalism has morphed technology into something that its original aims weren't supposed to fulfill. I wonder if we can give it another go. Now, I don't believe in Bitcoin, I believe that's a Ponzi scheme, but I do believe in the potential of blockchain, the, the ability to build what John Perry Barlow actually wanted, which was a, a, a decentralized web where governments wouldn't exist. But the argument in this book is we need more government, not less. I'd rather, um, and long live, you know, unfortunately he died this year, but John Perry Barlow's vision was, was one potentially we should be fighting for again. We what should retrieve the decentralized web. You governments of the world aren't welcome here. Yeah, he wanted the decentralized, he wanted a web that didn't become web 2.0, the internet of shopping. He wanted something which would be peer-to-peer -peer and would actually be something that would enable the human individual. And instead what we got were these platform stacks, these behavioral modification empires. And that's not the fault of the technology and the no, technologists who build it, it's the fault of capitalism. It's the fault of the, th the business models of these companies. So why should we double down on... on because on... there's no alternative. There's no alternative there, to the market. But, but why not? Why not? Because there aren't. I mean, right, but, a, why, why do right. we live forever? So, so, the, why, so, why, so, why so what you're arguing is, is, is borderline... So what you're arguing is a borderline acceler accelerationist manifesto of basically let's double down into the market let's allow non-human agents i.e corporations be, to become to become independent to become ais in their own right and then you'll have these corporations that exist independently of human beings generating wealth and hopefully we'll get the trickle down from it in the form of universal basic income is that what you're arguing no did i i didn't say that I, i'm just saying i don't think there is an alternative to a market-based economy in in this it, it, present, in, 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 in the, the present in the future in the context There's of multiple futures come on believe in me for a little bit hold my hand let's go there come on let's... Uh, i don't see any evidence you haven't convinced me you've just come up with a few because we're basing it on the tools and systems that we have in the present the book is based on the tools and systems whether it's education con consumer choice we've got to trust the fucking consumer to fix the future for us well the consumer and as i point out in the book the consumer has done a lot for example, in the, in the American car industry, the American car industry was dominant in the 1950s. And they got arrogant, like Silicon Valley has got arrogant now, and they started producing products that were really unfriendly to consumers, worse than unfriendly. They were deadly to consumers. So Ralph Nader wrote his famous book, Unsafe at Any Speed, in the mid-60s. And the American car industry essentially has declined and collapsed ever since because they lost their focus on providing consumers with reliable, honest products. Um, I well, think... Well, they're getting rid of the consumer to provide a reliable, honest product. They sit you in there and it drives itself now, and that's their plan. Get rid of the human agency. That's the result of that. There'll be, there'll be no crashes because it'd be an entirely automated system. No, but you had a situation where, over the last 50 years, the German and the Japanese car industries have replaced the American car industry. Um, so, you... you you know, you can talk about these abstract, in my view at least, kind of meaningless notions of post-capitalism and get all excited about it, but it's a waste of time. It, it's pointless. It's not realistic. It has no value. So there, are no, there are no alternatives. The, no. the, the future is going to be there a continuation no of the present, and we just have to fix the present to fix the there future. There is no is there? alternative in the next, in all of our lifetimes to the reality of market capitalism. So the best way to shape the future is to do it in a way using a mix of, if I said, suggest in the book, regulation and education, consumer power, citizen engagement. That's what we should be doing. We can fantasize and fetishize over whatever we like, but it's a waste of time. And actually it's worse than a waste of time. It's counterproductive because ultimately then in the end, nothing gets done. It's better to focus on actual things. The, the point of my book, the reason I wrote this book, is not like Douglas Rashkoff to sit in some 
studio in Brooklyn and theorize a beautiful he's in future. Queens. Douglas Wherever is in Queens. He is. Douglas is a friend of Virgil Futures. Uh, he's a friend of mine. He's a lovely he's guy. And he's a smart studio guy. studio apartment. I think it's two beds. Yeah, whatever he got. You know, you can do that. I went out in the world. That's I looked, Hastings. That's I looked at Singapore. I went, to, you know, I spent time in Singapore. I spent time in Estonia. I spent time in Germany, in Brussels. Spent any time in Africa? No, I didn't spend any time Why there. not? They're building the future. They no, already they, have the decentralized platforms that allow them to yeah. re- geotarget. Well, and they're, they're doing technology great because they jumped over the shit that we fucked up. Yeah. Give me some examples. So, all right. So, Akon, the music artist, weirdly enough, is doing Akon. What about that? The, the decentralized uh, yeah, that payment system directly through Ken- mobile. Kenyan. It's allowing, it's allowing yeah. um, in, in Africa. What about the Arab Spring? Well, that was a big deal, wasn't it? Yeah, but, uh, but again, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's not what we want. nonsense. It's, it got co-opted. It's, look, you can look. You can fantasize about anything you want, but it's not realistic. The market is the key mechanism. Whether whether you like it or not, there's no alternative. And it's best to work with the market. And it's best to work with innovators. So, and I still but think you're not that you're arguing for human agency. And, and the yeah, but that's what human agency nastiest is. Nastiest non-human agency is is the market. It mean? is an AI in its own right. It's it's a it's a disembodied entity. It's a non-human agent that's causing a massive amounts of harm. We don't have AI, but we do have corporations, and corporations are what we actually fear when we talk about fearing AI. Corporations have personhood. They have non-human agency. And they're causing massive amounts of harm to human beings. You argue that we fixed a lot of the problems in the Industrial Revolution. Those problems are still here in the environment Mm. and in everything. Well, that's true. Look, I'm not ideal. You you can't... The the point, again, it comes back to utopia. The point is you can't fix all this stuff. All utopias end up being dystopias. That's That's the... punchline where'd you read that all utopias end up being dystopias i mean look in the industrial revolution in the middle of the 19th century you had 11 year olds working in factories you had cities that were pretty much uninhabitable death traps you had there was an absence of social security systems and healthcare systems there was no safety net for, for, for unlucky people or for lucky people that matter much has improved it's not ideal you still have environmental problems and inequality and all the rest of it but the, the industrial model is the one that works. And we see, you saw what happened when you tried to radically reform the market um, in, 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 in the Bolshevik experience or the Chinese experience, or for that matter, the German Nazi experience. They don't work and they end up in catastrophe. So we're better off in the context of all these digital problems to work with the market. Now you can, I mean, I don't know what you even mean by the market being an AI. It's a sort of a conceptual, a, a clever conceptual idea, but I don't know what it means. Uh, the, the market is not AI. The market is, an, is, is a mechanism. Corporations uh, represent the market, everything. Wait, hold on, wait, the market is a mechanism to connect buyers and sellers. That's not AI. Why, why is the market AI? Why is capitalism AI? We have human agents. We have non-human agents. There's non-human agents that are causing great deals of harm to humans are non-human agents with non-human personhood, which are corporations. Corporations uh, embody I, everything we fear about AI. They, they have their own right system. They're disembodied they're entities. Sense. That you're not making any sense. All right. Let's move uh, maybe on. Maybe we should have some questions. Give we some, should move on. But firstly, tell me what you love about Estonia and Singapore. What can we actually learn from Estonia and Singapore? Well, I think Estonia, as I said, I think it's extremely innovative. I think it's an important model, particularly for local government, for creating a kind of uh, social contract in data between government and individuals, where the government has a degree of accountability. I think the big challenge about the data future is whether or not we can protect privacy. And it's still, it's a tough one to, I mean, of course, all of us would like to sort of, you know, someone like Snowden believes in the the ideal of, of having privacy, and it's a very attractive ideal. Who doesn't believe in that? But I'm just not sure in, in the smart future of you know, smart cities, smart bodies, smart this and that, whether we're ever really going to be able to protect data privacy. So what the Estonians are trying to do is innovate by connecting, um, um, by, by forcing the government or legislating so that the government when it does look at our records at least is accountable you know that's a much better model obviously than the the chinese model which as i said is a form of digital orwellianism um you know singapore i'm more ambivalent about singapore is a tricky one because of its political system uh but you know singapore is a, is a highly successful country extremely high quality of education very high v- tr- values of trust i mean one of our scarcities is trust, our crisis of trust. 
And both in Singapore and Estonia, there's very high belief in the value of government. So I think that they're interesting models, particularly at the local level. So I, I did a conversation, I had a conversation with the governor of Rhode Island, which is a small uh, East Coast uh, US state. Um, and um, Gina Raimondo, who's the governor there, she's a Democrat, she's a very smart woman, Rhodes Scholar, former VC. She, um, she is trying to sort of deploy, or she's been inspired by, by the Estonian model to, to develop sort of data policies in, in, in Rhode Island. I, the, the, the problem with central government, particularly in the US and the UK, is it's essentially dysfunctional. It's broken down on so many different levels that hopefully we can rebuild it at the local level, maybe at the state level or the city level. I think what you see in the UK are some of the best, smartest young political figures getting involved in local government. Same is true in the US. And I think both the Estonian, well, especially the Estonian model, is interesting in that sense. I don't idealize Estonian connectedness. I'm more ambivalent about Estonia's obsession with, say, teaching digital in schools. I'm not convinced that's necessarily the right thing. You know, I think to teach agency is perhaps more important to experiment with Waldorf-style education reforms rather than getting everyone to become programmers, partly because AI does programming so well. Not everybody gets to go to a Waldorf school, and the only reason the Silicon Valley elites send their kids to Waldorf schools is so they don't have to watch the fucking advertising that's running through their platforms. They get to be creative and do all the nice little things outside of all the shit yeah, that they're feeding I, no, the I'm other not, kids who I, don't I get the pleasure that. of going but, to Waldorf you schools. Know, Waldorf, uh, how much do you know about the Waldorf system? Only that it's mainly an elitist system. Well, that shows how little you know. Did you even read the section on, on education in the book? Yes, I read the section on education. Well, I I'd give you a personal example. My daughter goes to the largest public Waldorf high school in the country in, in northern california it's not for the elite so anyone can go you don't have to pay um and they're doing some really interesting things now of course it's true that there are private waldorf schools where the silicon valley people send their kids but the point about that is to show that the teaching of if you like agency or the encouragement of of, of schools which don't promote the screen in class is even something that the Silicon elite value. So that's something that we should try and um, that's something that we should try and develop throughout the education system. Those are real reforms. I mean, this a, a state-based innovative high school system is is essential if we're going to fix a lot of this stuff. Can we can we to a degree? So we're seeing the Silicon Valley, and let's not talk about elitism. But we're seeing the Silicon Valley folks slowly lining up to be the Cassandras of the digital revolution. Everybody's saying, oh, yeah, Sean, uh, Sean Parker was the latest saying, oh, you know, we designed this thing this no, way. Travis, Travis Kalanick's the latest. Uh, he came out yesterday. With, oh, Travis is in you. Uh, with a fund to uh, fix unemployment. So, so, so maybe it's not government. Should we turn back around to these companies and go, look, you broke it, you fix it? Well, I think that's part. Of, I think that's part of the solution. I think that, that model, again, in, in a market system is one that clearly has value. I think a model, you know, one example of someone who's done that quite well is Craig Newmark. He was the founder of Craigslist. And Craigslist, uh, as we all know, broke local journalism accidentally. He didn't know what he was doing. It disintermediated local journal, you know, local papers. Their business model was the sale of uh, small ads. And Craigslist gave this stuff out for free. It killed local journalism, killed a lot of papers. And Craig Newmark was horrified with what he did. And he spent a lot of the time and the wealth he amassed through Craigslist trying to fix that. Now, I'm not saying that's an ideal model, but that's better than Larry Ellison spending on, you know, yachts. Or, or I think certainly Elon Musk probably sending trying to fly to space. Yeah. yeah, so I think that we have to take, look, this is, for better or worse, these people are the new elite. They are. They need to become more accountable. And some of them are better than others. I mean, Benioff of Salesforce is better than Teal. Uh, Reid Hoffman of LinkedIn is, I think, more credible than Mark Andreessen, who fetishizes the market. Uh, I think we have to be realistic. The, the ones who I think are most dangerous are the ones who still believe that the, the market can work on its own. I think that's the most utopian and dangerous idea. And we, Vinny Gupta, the, the blockchain expert, argues that 
You know, some of them may have good intentions, but some of them may end up being the Nerd Reich. And then we're in real the trouble. What? The, the nerd, nerd Reich. The Nerd Reich. The but what does that mean? The... Nerd Reich or Reich? Reich. But what's that? I Reich. mean, that's again, uh, what does that mean? Anyway, so we're going to open it up to questions. Um, I think we agree on more than we disagree we on anything. We don't agree on anything. Um, I'm not sure. You're, um, you're like, uh, I mean, do you really believe, you, you, honestly, you still have not come up with Go any on. evidence there is any alternative to the market. We're trying. We're, We're trying, trying here. This 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 so this, this gathering is a platform for these sorts of experiments. I think we still should experiment with radical thinking and not just rely on pre-existing systems and just double down in w what we have already. We should allow these experiments to occur. And if we mess up, so what? We should take those risks. We took those risks. We ended up in this situation. Now let's just take some more risks and see where we end up. Yeah, I, as I said, I think that's very irresponsible because I think that it's a waste of time and actually a waste of resources as well. You're better off working within the market on practical solutions than coming up with abstract and unrealizable and unrealistic um, visions that just... Well, we're each to our own may, allowed may, to build may, the futures. They make us feel very virtuous, uh, but don't work. Well, let's Preston, sort of build that's, that's the futures that we want. Think. Can you wait? Sorry, can you wait for the microphone? Just so. yeah. Is it being recorded? Yeah, just it's going to be a big hit on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've got a couple of questions and like an idea potentially. Um, one, do you believe that infinite exponential growth is possible within a closed system? Two. Like on a, a like a planet, a, like a, 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 a planet. A planet. Yeah. That's a closed system. Yeah. Within limits, unless you go to space. Um, two. I should forget that. Um, in, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good. That's a good question. Um, I think, so I think, yeah, I think that's a fair question. What well, one last thing is that I am working on a platform at the minute to try to create something new. I'd have an AI that has two main streams coming into it, one from direct democracy to measure sentiment and the other to take projects and supply and demand to create a system of like resource management within ecological limits. Sorry, so the question was? Well, that was the idea. The question was, can we, can we live in I, don't, I mean, that's a, it, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I don't know. I, uh, what do I know? Uh, <sighs> How to fix the future, hopefully. Yeah, I, I don't know that it's... Look, you, you're, it's an interesting question in the... Con if, if you want to think of it in technological terms. Given our current knowledge of technology, it isn't. But you never know, I guess. I mean, you, if you had a technologist here, they might claim that it's... I mean, if... I don't know, Jerome might not say this, but certainly uh, someone like, um, yeah, what's his name? Uh, the, the, uh, what's his name? You know, the one who thinks he can live forever. Aubrey. No, the American. Aubrey de Grey, Ray Kurzweil. Kurzweil. Uploading minds, freezing bodies. Or Peter or... Diamantis would say that. <laughs> You've got to pick the methodology. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I see your point. I mean, it's an interesting question. So you're basically saying that we're going to come to a crisis anyway. I mean, I think Moore, let's use it in the context of Gordon Moore's law. I think my understanding of physics, not that I have a particularly sophisticated, I think I failed O-level physics. Uh, I know I failed O-level physics. I don't think I even <laughs> took O-level physics. But my understanding for all my failures in O-level physics is that Moore's law in, in physical terms ultimately has to, it can't go on forever. At some point, you know, the chipboard will become so physically small, it just will be impossible to continue to do it forever. And at that point, then, your question becomes an interesting one. Because this exponential growth, which is what Moore's law is, you know, every two years, computer power doubles, which explains why we can carry these, you know, 50 years ago, these supercomputers around in our pockets. That won't go on forever. Um, unless we come up with fundamental new technologies. 
Uh, but, you know, you could have asked that question in the 1930s or 40s, and this was before the invention of silicon, the, the invention of digital. Yeah, so it's, it's an impossible question. In other words, it's, it's an interesting question, but I don't think it's possible to answer. Yeah. You know, steal a question. Um, actually, I really appreciate you coming here and putting this side of these stories. Uh, sometimes they're, they're quite like, difficult to uh, actually down in the basement and be socialist and uh, fantasize about. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, the, the virtual of the virtual. Um, Can I have some more tea, though? <laughs> Talking about the end of capitalism. <laughs> On a historical note, I, I've seen some conversations about Google needing to be tackled in a similar manner to the way that Standard Oil was yeah, tackled. and I talk about that in the book. I haven't I read the book, but that's friend, a conversation way, I to have. I, I, I'm not encouraging you to buy the book, but I, I don't think you're... I don't know whether you've read it or not, but I don't think you're being fair to the book. The book is a, and a serious attempt to come up with practical solutions to all this stuff. And, and I compare, you know, the, the Standard Oil model is an important one. In, in, the, in the late 19th century, you had capitalist companies that were unaccountable, whether it was Standard Oil or the railroad companies or the banks, and they were taken on by the antitrust lobby. <coughs> and that accounted, excuse me, for really for the foundations of uh, the New Deal and, 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 and a stronger state, a more uh, in, engaged state. So I think that's, to me, that is the most essential thing. Uh, I don't necessarily believe these companies should be broken up, although I think of all the companies, as I said, the one that I think we are ultimately going to fear the most and may end up being broken up is Amazon because it plays in so many areas and because it's so brilliantly run. I mean, again, at, at some point, it, it's like your question about exponential growth. At some point, Amazon's going to hit the wall. You know, Facebook won't because I think it's in decline uh, I, I, Google is still a, a, a one-horse pony, mostly in search. But Amazon, I think, will become probably, ultimately. But we need to, and I talk about this in the book, we need to rethink antitrust law. Antitrust law was invented in the 19th century as a def uh, in the language of the consumer. What Amazon has done so brilliantly is build itself as a consumer-focused company, which it does do. I mean, look, we've all bought on Amazon. It's an amazing product. But we need to think of antitrust beyond just the consumer. And if indeed Amazon is becoming more and more powerful in more and more markets, then there's going to be a need for a revision of antitrust law. But I think antitrust is important. And I think Vestager, you know, she may not be a hero to you. She may not have involved, you know, she may not have uh, finished capitalism or whatever else you want to do, but she is actually changing the world. She is, more than anyone else, taking on the platform. She's finding them. She's controlling them. She's creating a fairer marketplace, which gives entrepreneurs more opportunities. And I think that's the thing we should be, that's the thing we should be rewarding and applauding and focusing on, rather than abstract, meaningless theories of a post-capitalist age, which will never happen. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you deploy the plan? So how do, how do you deploy the one? Your plan. So the so when you say uh, we need to develop a sense of agency in people or uh, have more regulation. Yeah. Uh, how can we deploy? Uh, That's like, a great question. Like spread it like uh, a sense of agency into people. Right. Or, uh, you know, like the very, world very of school question. and so right. on. Right. Uh, so. So it's the five tools. I mean, it's you know, it comes through education. Um, but we do it in all sorts of ways, and we can do it as consumers by demanding more accountable products. We can do it by electing politicians who are committed to antitrust and to changing the system and taking on the platforms. We can do it by uh, becoming entrepreneurs and working on products that uh, are a rejection of surveillance capitalism. Uh, I have some examples in Germany of search engines which are anti-Google but are still pro-market. Um, we can do it as parents by trying to control our, our children's technological addiction. Um, we can do it as children by actually embracing analog. I have, you know, it's, it's always too easy in these books to write off the kids. They're always the ones who get blamed for everything, the so-called I generation. But I actually think it's the digital natives who will eventually save us. They're the ones who are going to rediscover or are rediscovering analog. They're the ones who are buying vinyl. They're the ones who are rediscovering handwriting. 
they're the ones who are paying now for their online content. So it happens in many different ways. Agency, you know, there is no app for agency, if you like. There is no, okay, we're all going to become agents now. It, it happens in all sorts of ways. That's the nature of our history as a species, is we work, and the history of the Industrial Revolution is a good example. Union activists, we know that the, the, the unions were incredibly important in, in giving working people rights. So in the book, I talk about lawyers who are taking on the sharing companies to, <coughs> excuse me, to make sure that um, they obey the law in terms of protecting them in the marketplace. So lawyers, teachers, parents, uh, politicians, business people, these are realistic solutions. They're not fantasy. They're not pie in the sky. Um, and it takes many of them many years to work this stuff out. Think of all this stuff as a kind of stack. We all think, you know, most of you are probably technologists, you're comfortable with the idea of the stack behind any kind of technology. This is the human stack. This is what makes history. And it's people working together, not always knowingly. There's no overall plan. There's no five-year plan or 10-year plan or 20-year plan to fix the future. It comes about spontaneously. And some of the sort of pots that I talk about, regulation, innovation, education, they kind of, they're mixed in together. But this is what human history is. It's messy. It's crooked. It has no absolute pattern unless you believe it can all be imposed from above, which I don't. It's, a good, it's the key question. And, and I know my answer isn't adequate. But this is the best I can do. And one can never do any better when you're talking about really fixing the future. Because it's never that self-evident. Unless you come up with these fantastic, fantastically seductive abstractions that don't work in practice. We'll see. Yep. Um, as a student of history, you're... Uh, belief in the market or your disbelief in anything aside from the market uh, is that just uh, historically you see what has successfully yeah. happened um, is your disbelief in what could potentially happen your sort of not denigration but your disbelief in what could potentially happen you have a certainty in what has happened, but at the time before it was a certainty, yeah. it wasn't a certainty, it was a potential. Yeah. And now you, you, you have a certainty in what is going to happen, despite the fact that there are potentials. Yeah, you're right. Look, now we're, we're talking about the future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, you're obviously right. Um, uh, I've, you know, I've made many, many bad predictions. In one of my books, I predicted that Facebook would go out of business. So I've... What? And some good ones, but some bad and some good ones, but some bad ones too. Yeah, everyone can get it wrong. No one knows, obviously, because that's why it's the future. But um, let me just rephrase what you know. Your your point's a fair one, but let me just rephrase what you said up front. My the set, what did you say about the? I, I don't. I, I the, the 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 for example the saying that the only way forward is the market we have to operate okay, within right, the framework me, which we right, are okay. in but let me also the, the explain fact that there yeah. is no other option my book may come a surprise given this kind of conversation but my book argues that the problem with silicon valley is it fetishized the market i, I borrow carl pugliani's argument about the dangers of utopian market belief uh, pugliani ex blamed the rise of both communism and fascism on our on the early 20th and 19th century fetishization of the free market. Um, and I take Polanyi's argument and suggest, and again, I don't think I'm particularly original. A lot of people have done it. I've done it specifically with Polanyi. But basically what's happened over the last 25 years in Silicon Valley is a repeat of that. So I am not in any way an ideologue of the market. All I am saying, uh, certainly the market without having any controls around it, which is what, you know, the free market people of the 19th, 20th and Silicon Valley, that's what they all want. I just do not see an alternative in economics, as an economic system, 
you know, talking about, I, you know, I like Paul Mason. He's a fantastic journalist and a very spirited, interesting guy. But he talks about, it. and then it, I love the notion. I admire anyone who comes out with, you know, a book called Post Capitalism. It's like How to Fix the Future, very compelling title. But there's no, he doesn't explain really what post capitalism is. Douglas Rushkoff, I like him, I respect him. He imagines a post-capitalist future, but I don't know what it means. I don't see the core economics of any society operating independent. I don't see an alternative to the market as the motor of our economy. Having said that, though, I believe strongly in the role of regulation. That's why you have balance. That's why you need regulation. Um, so I'm not a, a, a market utopian. I'm not a market absolutist. Um, but I just don't know how else it works, unless you have a very strong state. But we know how the disasters that have happened. In, you know, the latest one you want to look at is North Korea. Um, it doesn't work. Or you can have a kind of state-based capitalism like in China, supported by a neo-totalitarian government. I mean, I'm not, as I said to you earlier, that's the real nightmare. Um, uh, sort of combining totalitarianism and capitalism in a, in, a, in a government that makes enormous wealth for itself and its people. So I, I need to, I mean, you and I are sparring over this idea of post-capitalism because I don't know what it means. Um, but that does not mean that I'm a market absolutist. I'm just hoping your daughter with a Waldorf education will think of more creative alternatives. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> go ahead. Um, on, on that point, on regulation, uh, my question is, how do you, um, how do you, what do you do with regulation to ensure a positive future? Because we, you know, since Thatcher, I mean, your, your comment about the market always reminds me of Thatcher, you know, there's no alternative. Um, since Thatcher and, and, and outsourcing, we've had tremendous regulation, but it's always post hoc, it's after the event. It doesn't really become effective yeah. and the perpetrators escape. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, we had, I had did an interesting event this morning where someone was talking about Britain as a sort of, uh, in, a, a, a post-Brexit Britain as being one which could sort of be the, the middle ground between European regulation and American free market capitalism. Um, I think that one of the one of one of the um, uh, tragedies of Brexit will be that Britain will leave a more r responsible r regulatory environment and fall outside and you know end up in you know in the American camp. Uh, I mean, it's a really good question. Regulation in itself is not the solution. It has to be accountable and responsible. There's lots of regulation of technology which I disagree with. You know, the French and a lot of the French stuff is, I, I think, is wrong. The French and Spanish determination to somehow punish Google for everything they do means that they were trying to find Google News every. T they were trying to charge Google News every time Google News sent somebody from Google News to a newspaper. But that's what happens when you regulate these platforms. You, you create the wrong sorts of regulations. No, you don't it truly understand. The Germans are trying work. to do the same with YouTube, 24 hour turnarounds on, on well, what's wrong content. Well, what's wrong with that? They're going to find them but massively. It's not possible from a technological perspective. Yes, YouTube's it is. YouTube's trying the best they can, but they can't watch every single piece of Well, content. they have to, but, that, but that's exactly why this regulation is really good, because it forces YouTube to become accountable and to acknowledge that it's a media company. And it is possible if they hire editors, if they hire curators. These people have reaped the benefit of being completely unaccountable, becoming massive media companies without having any of the accountability of traditional media companies. They've got away with murder in every sense. And the German initiative in fining them massively is the only way, as I argue in the book, the, you can convince, you. these people will promise you everything. They say, oh, we're trying, oh yeah, we're doing it, but it will only change when they get fined. So I would argue that the German initiative is a really, really important one. And regulation can work, antitrust works, privacy stuff works, it worked in the Industrial Revolution, it worked, it's the only, it, it doesn't mean it's the only solution, but it's essential. And it's particularly essential in terms of 
making the market fairer, giving more people more opportunity, leveling the playing field. Because at the moment, we're back in the 90s. You remember with Microsoft, they wanted to essentially turn the internet into a, an extended version of Microsoft, and they would have done that if it hadn't been for antitrust. They would have, you know, Google, Microsoft would have crushed Google and, and, and made Google, um, Microsoft search dominant. They would have crushed Facebook as they tried to crush Net, Netscape and AOL. They would have done exactly the same thing, and it's only regulators that stop it. So these are real examples. They're not fanciful. Any other oh, questions? Yeah. Oh, uh, just thinking in terms of uh, future agencies, um, yeah. how do you think, yeah, yeah, I was just thinking, uh, like immersive technologies like AR, how do you think it will like disrupt the future or do you think it won't make an impact? Or I think that's a, that's a fascinating question. I mean, really one of the, the great questions of, you know, because you're going to have technology that will potentially at least shape agency. We're going to have augmented reality. These are all, again, I don't mean to always fall back on regulation, but we're certainly need, going to need to think very seriously about what aspect of this gets regulated, whether we should regulate it, and its impact on, on both technology companies and on, on, on citizens and consumers. Um, yeah, as you have technology that can, if you like, augment agency... It becomes extremely interesting and challenging at the same time. It can also diminish agencies, and let's not just assume it's going. Well, you know, Brave New. I mean, I think Brave New World is um, Postman in his famous book, "Amusing Ourselves to Death." He wrote it in 1984. He said famously, "It begins a brilliant first page." He says, uh, "We always got it wrong. We thought the future was all well, and, and, and it actually has turned out to be Huxley in his Brave New World." And I think Huxley's I imagination of uh, sort of technocracy and addiction um, and of extreme inequality between a technocratic elite and an underclass. It's very accurate of, what, of what's happening in this world. So, absolutely. Hi, thank you very much. It's been fascinating. And I'm going to buy the book. It was great. Oh, you are good. Um, ty ty he loves the book, title secretly. as it he is would or not. never admit it. Um, I, I'm still struggling, though, to understand. Um, whether this is a kind of very minor trim at the hairdresser rather than, or even a snip, rather than a full-on haircut. I mean, in terms of focus on yeah. corporates, I mean, really, if we imagined a future where instead of a Google, there was a regulated group of 50 companies filling that space, and perhaps even the same in the other spaces we've talked about, we're still talking about, at best, a 0.1% as opposed to a 0.001%. And I wonder how that matters really to the issue at hand, which is agency for the majority of human beings. And therefore, come back to this question about the system. I mean, I don't, like you, um, I also can't think of a better system currently. But what I'm also not willing to accept is that there's such a tiny, tiny incremental benefit offered by addressing these corporates. Again, we might be talking about 0.001% improving to 1% of Explain. the... I, I so if you imagined a future where you had much of the regulation that we're, yeah. we're going towards and um, in place, and you had instead of a, an oligopoly, perhaps 100 companies or even 1,000 companies, you're still talking about a tiny percentage of the population with a massive unfair, I would argue, um, this is my comment on the system, distribution uh, of wealth. And um, I don't believe that that improvement is going to make much of a dent on, on agency with respect to um, the average Joe on the street of whom I'm one. I don't think I'll own one of these companies or be a creative contributing to that ecosystem. So is it really going to make any difference that matters? I think that's a fair question. I, I think, let me give you one, you know, I, I think that um, I went to India and I saw the ways in which the national ID system was actually empowering people without identity. So it can have a big impact on people, technological innovation. You know, I, I didn't do it in Africa, but I'm sure you could find similar sorts of examples. I mean, you could come up with radical solutions for, I guess, what, na what, what, what turning these into national utilities, turning them into what, the equivalent of the electric company or the railway company? Is that what you're saying? No, I don't think that would help either. It's still, it's the, so the, you're the, saying the there's powers. nothing you can do? Well, I am, I am despite my um, apologetic at the beginning, hinting that we probably do need to rethink the fundamentals. Um, the, the tweaking around regulation, education with a view to yeah. helping us tweak the regulation and, and manage corporates is not going to do anything more than increment on an increment. 
and it's just I can't conceptually get myself to, to a position where I can see it's going to make a fundamental difference. So it changes and the rules of the game, but we're so still we, playing the game. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's probably true, but you, you could have said. I mean, we we had the same arguments for for for. for Fifty or almost a hundred years about the industrial revolution, the same arguments. You know, look back in the eighty. You know, the arguments, particularly between democratic socialists and communists, over the reform of capitalism. You have the same arguments that this thing come. I mean, in particularly in the German Social Democratic Party, same argument about whether the system is reformable and whether, as you say, you know, a full haircut can actually be done. And we know what happened. We know that actually the reforms of Bismarck, who was anything but a socialist, were actually more significant for the benefit of working people, of, of ordinary people, than anything that the socialists came up with. Um, so it can be done, but we have to be patient. I think one of the problems is we're very impatient. We're looking for very simple solutions uh, because we live in an age of you know, impatience and, and and, and, and uh, an age where we're promised continually that everything can be fixed overnight uh, and in a sort of direct, um, this sort of direct democracy, real time, always on culture, uh, actually we have an increasing uh, chasm, a contradiction between our sort of, our ability to discuss this stuff in real time and the struggle to actually make any change or difference and that's i think one of the most frustrating and sort of existential challenges this is why we all feel so confused and frustrated because we can all go and it's what happened in the arab spring or it happened what the occupy movement is we all went on these platforms and we all thought we were changing the world and nothing happened in fact you know with the arab spring not only did nothing happen things turned out to be a lot worse than in the future than they were in the past. So. Because a version of the pre-existing system just filled the gap. That's why the Arab Spring, yes, the, the digital platforms kind of had this promise. Well, I don't think we can... But what yeah. we had was more of the same. Fill the chasm that was left after that initial um, enthusiasm. Yeah, I think that's true. But I think my point is that we have to... We have to realize, I mean, this is where you and I differ, is I don't believe that change is possible. So I think what we need to do is calibrate expectations. And it's all too easy in our age of instant gratification and instant solutions to think that these things can be solved simply overnight with new systems. And, and they can't. So we need to be patient. We need to roll up our sleeves. We need to understand that it takes a lot of work and multiple generations and strategies to fix the future. It always has done, and it always will do. I, Hi. So um, I agree with the idea of they have to be accountable, but some of that is too late. So what I'd like to see is a little more self-awareness before they get to that stage right. where you know, um, someone says, ooh, that's not a good idea. <laughs> You, have you actually thought through what the consequences of what you're suggesting are? So even though I'm not a giant Sheryl Sandberg fan, mm. she has been a humanizing element of some of the more less than exciting ideas if you actually enacted them that came out of Facebook. Where would you get people that these guys would listen to who aren't Elon Musk and his mates because they're – ethics committee is just full of either the techno utopians or the people who have really like drunk the Kool-Aid who would do that you mean within Silicon Valley well yes so the well, east think, coast tech companies seem to suffer a bit less from yeah. this kind of behavior I mean I in, in the book I uh, interview in the book is a series of interviews with different people trying all this stuff I interview a woman called um, uh, Frida Kapoor Klein who is the co-founder of the Kapoor Center in Oakland. She's a VC, but she's her, her firm. It always includes partners like Ben Jealous, who's running for governor of Maryland, who's um, former head of the NCAAP. Um, she's focused on investing in companies that, um, uh, the, the, that really actively support minority rights or make sure that women and minorities are represented within the tech industry, you know, it's a sort of an HR-focused 
investment firm. Uh, Steve Case is doing a lot in terms of his rise of the rest of investing in startups and technologies outside Silicon Valley. So there are a lot of people trying stuff, some of it more legitimate than others. You know, some of the Silicon Valley stuff is, I think, gratuitous and, and rather distasteful. I think somebody like Sam Altman at uh, uh, Y Combinator, you know, he's a multi-billionaire and he's embraced minimum guaranteed income. And I think there's something rather distasteful about, you know, multi-billionaires saying, well, there are no jobs in the future, so let's give everyone $1,000 a month to live in poverty and whilst our technocratic elite will continue to make billions. I think that's really troubling. Uh, but there are genuine, I think, genuinely good people. Um, and I think we are in danger also of having a kind of, you know, the opposite of what used to exist, which is Silicon Valley as the solution. Now Silicon Valley is always the problem. So turning Silicon Valley into the next Wall Street and bashing it continually. And I'm not sure that's necessarily any better than idealizing it. Um, and I think future generations, I think the Me Too movement is, is very active in Silicon Valley. There are many uh, very able, innovative female entrepreneurs now who are starting uh, interesting companies that aren't, you know, boys club sorts of companies. So I think it will take time, but I think we'll begin to see the fruits of it relatively fast. Uh, you know, Sheryl Sandberg is... Again, I mean, a slightly ambivalent figure in, in many ways. But, you know, many of the original believers have turned against it. Roger McNamee is the uh, venture capitalist um, uh, at, um, I've forgotten, the, McNamee is a large venture firm. He was one of the early investors in Facebook. He was um, uh, Zuckerberg's mentor and then was so close to Zuckerberg that he introduced Cheryl to, to Zuckerberg and he ended up hiring. Uh, he, he was, he's, I had lunch with him a couple of weeks ago in San Francisco. He's become so unhappy with how Facebook has wrecked American democracy and um, corrupted the last election that he has, has become an outspoken critic of Facebook and Sandberg and Zuckerberg and is now kind of relocating himself in Washington, D.C. to try and address these issues. And he's teamed up with a guy called Tristan Harris who used to work at Google and now is sort of spearheading an engineering movement in which engineer, he's arguing engineers should be much more ethically responsible. So again, a lot of interesting stuff going on. It's easy to dismiss, and if you write all these people off as you know, capitalist apologists or evil rich people, then you're not going to take it seriously. But my two responses on that is firstly... That's not fair. Many of these people are extremely credible and relevant. And secondly, there isn't much of an alternative in many ways anyway. So uh, it's healthy. And the historical examples in America of, you know, Carnegie, for example, are important. I mean, Gates is doing a lot in terms of eradicating a lot of the, the diseases in the world. I think the problem is, is when you bring these Silicon Valley ideologies in and where, you know, Zuckerberg is say, well, I'm giving all my money to eradicating disease forever. It's a great tax break. Yes. Yeah, as a tax, exactly, it's a tax break, and it's entirely bogus, and it's exactly the kind of thinking that we don't want. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take billionaires who want to make the world a better place more seriously. It doesn't mean that we should completely reject philanthropy, especially in the U.S. It's a legitimate historical model, and because of the vagaries of the U.S. system, which nobody's going to change, certainly in the next few generations, unless there is really war or civil war, we just got to work within the system. It always worries me that they buy their plot of land in New Zealand before they start fixing the future. So, yeah. <laughs> look, if it's not going to be a revolution, it's going to be a continuation of the present, what can this audience do right now to fix the future? Well, of course, buy and read my book. That's the first thing. Uh, I think, as I said, I mean, to... to, 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 to and again, I am not sure... It doesn't sound like many of them agree with you on, on your uh, sort of faith in post-capitalism. Um, but I think we have to moderate our expectations. We have to be realistic. If we fantasize about something that can't be done, abstract systems that are wonderful in theory but are just not practical and not implementable, we're wasting our time. So to focus on the small, the realizable, the manageable, so whether that means getting involved in 
public interest groups to focus on various elements of regulation, whether that means as parents helping our kids deal with the addictive nature of technology, whether it means as uh, developers uh, refusing to develop technology which is addictive, whether it means embracing new companies that reject the current model, whether it's sort of, you know, the advertising centric model. So using ad blocking technology or search engines, which don't turn the user into the producer. There are many different ways of doing this, whether it's consumers demanding better products, whether it's as teachers experimenting with Waldorf and Montessori, whether it's university teachers, as I explain in the book, trying to combine the humanities and engineering schools. There's a lot of what we can do. I mean, it's all the, the other problem with your argument about this sort of post-capitalist fantasy is it only ultimately makes us feel more powerless. It only ultimately undermines the crisis of agency. Because the more we fantasize about post-capitalism, and this imaginary future that may sound wonderful but isn't realizable, ultimately the less powerful we are and feel. So ultimately, focusing on things that can't be done adds to the crisis of agency and only compounds the core problems of our modern age. So uh, I think this is a serious issue. That's why, you know, I wish someone like Douglas Groshkoff was here. I mean, I respect him and admire him. I certainly much more, much I much more respect him and admire him than the people, you know, the, the market fetishists on the right. But I just don't think what he says is realistic. And I don't see any evidence of this thing actually being able to work. Whilst accepting that, that you know, the haircut argument is credible. That, you know, if you go to the haircut and you have such a small trim that it doesn't really make any difference, then you're right. There is an issue. And I acknowledge that perhaps one kind of broad weakness in my moderate approach, I wouldn't say minimalist, but certainly moderate approach, is that it doesn't work miracles. Uh, but again, go back to the, I've been very influenced by the 19th century, go back to the debates within the German Social Democratic Party, go back to, and that's why the British Labour Party did so well, because it didn't fantasize about something that didn't work. And it'll be something that I think Hopefully, Corbyn, when he gets elected, will have to engage and figure out because he's promised an awful lot. But at some point, it's easy to promise a lot when you're in opposition. When he comes to power, then we'll see what he's able to deliver. Well, on that note, it sounds like we can't fix the future, but maybe we can iterate on the present. We can give uh, it a haircut, right? We can give it a haircut. If there's any anybody who wants trip. to go full bald, uh, then we fully encourage that. And on that note, I want to thank a couple of folks. Firstly, the Library Club for hosting us here very tonight. Good. And I want to thank you. You've been very, very good natured. I hope I haven't been too rude. No, not so. Not so. You're welcome back anytime. And we'll get Doug and you together at some point. We'll make that happen. Actually, July, he's in town. We're doing something on the 9th of July. Maybe we should get you together then. Um, books can be purchased uh, at the back of the room. And, and thank you to the volunteers. Thank you to Ben Greenaway, who's been with Virtual Futures for almost 25 years now, for helping us with the filming tonight's event. Um, you can support what we do through... Yeah, no, Jesus. We can support what we do through Patreon. But more than that, we prefer your input. Um, this is a community project. Um, so you can find out more about what we do and where we do it at Virtual Futures pretty much everywhere online. And I want to end with this, which is a warning, which is the same warning we end every single Virtual Futures with. And it's the fact that the future is always virtual. And some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and in those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this evening. We need more people like Andrew. Uh, please join me. We need less people like me. No, we need more people like you. If we can't, if we can't uh, friendly disagree. Anyway, look, please join me in thanking the incredible Andrew Keane.